the place where we see the ultimate expression of hate, unfairness, and cruelty in this world is also the place where we see the ultimate expression of love, and that is at the cross. We live in a hurting world. We are hurt people and hurting people. Hurting is natural. Forgiving is supernatural. Somebody hurt me yesterday, but I don't hate them. It was my doctor. I have to go in periodically, and yesterday they scrubbed my face with acid and then put it under this very painful light for almost 17 minutes, but it was in order to bring healing, so I don't hold it against them. But I've learned about hate. And forgiving requires that we get honest about hate and that we bring it to God. That's what I want to talk to you about for a few minutes today. Usmeeds writes this in his book called Forgive and Forget. It is people, not merely evil, that we hate. It's said that we're supposed to hate the sin and love the sinner. If we manage to do this, our hate can be creative, but I must admit I do not easily find the power to do this. The evil I hate wants to stick to the person I hate, the way that skin sticks to a body, and I can seldom tell them, tear them apart. We hate people. When we deny our hate, he says, we detour around the crisis of forgiveness. We suppress our spite, we make adjustments, we make believe that we are too good to be hateful, and here it is. The truth is we do not dare to risk admitting the hate we feel because we do not dare to risk forgiving the person we hate. And in the story of Joseph and his brothers, we're told in the 37th chapter, he tells a bad report to his father. They see how their father favors him, gives him the robe, and they hate Joseph. And then he tells them his grandiose dream about how one day they're all going to bow down before him. And it says in verse 8, and they hated him all the more. And then in verse 11, and they were jealous of him. And then in verse 20, they say, why don't we kill him? And then in verse 28, they sell him into slavery. Lou goes on. We most often aim our hatred at people who live within the circle of our committed love. We usually hate someone who is close to us, close enough to love. We hate the person we trusted to be on our side, the person we expected to be loyal, the person we trusted to keep a promise. We usually do not hate strangers. We get angry at strangers. Baseball games I have raged at cross-eyed umpire and gotten mad at the loud drunk sitting near me, but I never hated an umpire I didn't know personally. The only time we really hate strangers is when they get close enough to violate us intimately. Hatred for people within our circle of committed love is the most virulent kind. It does not affect us so much when we hate a person who has never promised to be with us, never walked with us on our private paths, never played the strings of our soul. But when a person destroys what our commitment and our intimacy created, something precious is destroyed. Hate for people we love makes us sick, and it does. The virus resists every antibody save one. And that one is what we're on the journey for together now. Um, grace and forgiveness. And we need heroes on that journey. Uh, so I want to tell you one of my heroes of forgiveness. This is a fictional character. And encourage you to find heroes of your forgiveness as you seek to bring your hate today. Bring the hate to God. This is from a book that you may know or a musical that you might have seen, Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. The central character, Jean Valjean, is a man who, out of desperation because his sister and her family was starving, stole some bread and got caught and got sentenced to five years in prison and then another 14 years for trying to escape. And part of what Victor Hugo is doing in this book is just noting how our world is filled with fallen systems of injustice and cruelty and unfairness. And people are both moral agents and also victims of evil beyond their capacity. And that's true for Jean Valjean. And eventually he is consumed by bitterness and hatred. When he's finally released from prison, he has a yellow passport and he can't get a job. He can't find a place to stay. He can find no 
kindness at all because he has been marked, he has been stigmatized, he has been rejected. And then one day he meets a bishop. It's Bishop Muriel, uh, and the book actually takes a long time to describe this remarkable character. When he's made bishop, he is given a palace to live in. It's magnificent, but he noticed that the poor are crowded into this little tenement building. So he actually swaps places and have them go live in the palace, and he goes live in that overcrowded building. And, and uh, it's said about him that he constantly visited the poor until he had no more money, and then he would visit the rich, and then he would get more money and go back to visit the poor. And uh, he was so beloved that the poor eventually give him a new name. They call him uh, Monseigneur Bienvenu, or however it's pronounced. Mr. Welcome is what it means. And this is the character that Jean Valjean uh, eventually goes to try to look for some kind of help, and he is allowed to stay inside and given a meal and he can eat with the last thing that the bishop has of value, the silver, but then he leaves in the middle of the night, steals the silver, the police bring him back to the bishop the next day. You know the scene. Ah, here you are, the bishop says, looking at Jean Valjean. I'm glad to see you, but how's this? I give you the candlesticks too, which are of silver like the rest, for which you can certainly get 200 francs. Why did you not carry them away with your forks and spoons? Jean Valjean opened his eyes wide and stared at the venerable bishop with an expression which no human tongue can render any account of. The police asked the bishop then, so it's true, we saw this man, it looked like he was running away, we stopped him. And he told you, interposed the bishop with a smile, that this had been given to him by a kind old fellow of a priest whom he had passed the night with? I see how the matter stands. And you have brought him back here? It's a mistake. In that case, the police asked, we can let him go? Certainly, the bishop said. My friend, resumed the bishop, before you go, here are your candlesticks, take them. And he stepped to the chimney piece, took the two silver candlesticks and brought them to Jean Valjean. The two women who served the bishop looked down without uttering a word, without a gesture, without a look which could disconcert the bishop. Jean Valjean was trembling in every limb. He took the two candlesticks mechanically and with a bewildered, bewildered air. Now said the bishop, go in peace. By the way, when you return, my friend, it is not necessary to pass through the garden. You can always enter and depart through the street door. It is never fastened with anything but a latch, either by day or by night. And then the bishop drew him near and said in a low voice, do not forget, never forget. You have promised to use this money in becoming an honest man. Jean Valjean, who had no recollection of ever having promised anything, I love that, the bishop promises for him, remained speechless. The bishop had emphasized the words when he uttered them. He resumed with solemnity. Jean Valjean, my brother, you, are no, long, you no longer belong to evil, but to good. It is your soul that I buy from you. I withdraw it from black thoughts and the spirit of perdition, and I give it to God. And as you may know, in the book, Jean Valjean is filled with an inexpressible rage at this, not yet contrition. And he actually is utterly confused, and he goes out and he commits one more crime. He steals a coin from a child, and then he is overwhelmed with remorse and he tries to track down the child and he can't. And the contradiction between the bishop's character and his own heart and his own life is too much for him. And he falls to the ground and he cries, I'm a wretch. And he begins to sob. And Hugo says it's the first time he cried in 19 years. And then he realizes his soul has been bought at a price and given to God. And in the New Testament, Peter says, do you not know that you have been bought with something more precious than silver or gold, but with the precious blood that is the life and then the death, and the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. And so we bring our hate to God. 
the place where we see the ultimate expression of hate, unfairness, and cruelty in this world is also the place where we see the ultimate expression of love, and that is at the cross. So, the last word belongs to Valjean today. He is an old man dying alone. He has poured out the years that are left in his life in uh, sacrificial love to all the people around him. And when his daughter and her husband, Cosette Marius, find out the extent of his love and the sacrifice, they rush to him, but he's dying. On this page, I write my last confession. Read it well when I last am sleeping. It's the story of those who always loved you. Your mother gave her life for you and gave you to my keeping. And then Fontaine, the mother whom death could not keep, comes to him and says, Come with me where chains can never bind you. All your grief at last, at last behind you. Lord in heaven, look down on him in mercy. Forgive me all my trespasses and take me to your glory. Take my hand and lead me to salvation. Take my love, for love is everlasting, and remember the truth that once was spoken. To love another person is to see the face of God. And I've told some of you when we first saw that show, Nancy said to me, God should have put that in the Bible. And later on, I showed her it's actually in Genesis 33.10, the story of the reconciliation between two brothers, Jacob and Esau, that were separated by hatred and enmity, and God restores them. And Jacob says to Esau, for me to see your face is like seeing the face of God. And Nancy said, I'm so glad God took me up on that and put that in the Bible. And then these words, do you hear the people sing, lost in the valley of the night? It is the music of a people who are climbing to the light. For the wretched of the earth, there is a flame that never dies. Even the darkest night will end and the sun will rise. I am the light of the world, he says. All the hatred in the world, all the darkness of the world cannot put that out. And you and I have been redeemed by that. So the word for today is forgiven. I am forgiven. You are forgiven. Disoriented. Dazzled by that light. Wherever hatred has been festering in me, in you, for whomever, don't pretend like it's not there. Don't deny it. Name it. And bring it to God today. Bring it to God today. Forgive us our debts as we forgive. Thanks for joining us. At Become New, we want to grow spiritually one day at a time, but it's tough to do that alone. So we're offering a little more support for anyone who would like to work on putting the content into practice. You can sign up to receive a text at the end of each week in this series, asking if you completed the here's how portion for that week. If you want, you can reply to the text and let us know how it went, or if you need prayer in taking those action steps. To sign up for the end of week reminder, just text the word MORE to 855-888-0444 and we'll put you on the list. As always, to receive the emails or video links by text, you can let us know at becomenew.com slash subscribe. If you're already signed up for the emails but aren't getting them, try checking your spam folder or better yet, you can add us to your contact list. Our email address is connect at becomenew.com. If you need prayer, we're here for you. Text your specific prayer request to 855-888-0444. There's a team of us who meet each weekday to pray specifically over every person who sends a text in. We'll catch you next time.